Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to D News Plus again today. I am Trace, and this is episode two of three in our new series on plastic. Plastic is everywhere around you. You probably don't even notice that it's there anymore. It's so ubiquitous. So we wanted to figure out what exactly is this stuff and where did it come from and who invented it? We also wanna figure out how do you actually get rid of it? Because if it's in everything, we gotta figure out how to get it out of everything and then either recycle it or dispose of it safely. We also wanna know what a world without this stuff would look like. If it is this ubiquitous, could we ever just get rid of it entirely? So today we're gonna to talk about how we get rid of plastic. Let's kick into it. We know what a plastic is, it's a lot of MERS. You know, we got monomers that make up polymers and homopolymers and copolymers, but we wanna know how those MERS correspond to the numbers that you see on a plastic bottle. Because I don't know if you've got plastic around you right now, but if you pick up like a milk bottle, milk jug, it's got a little recycle thing on the bottom with a number in the middle. If you hold most plastic things, you know, any plastic bottle, they're gonna have one of these numbers and they range number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we wanted to figure out what exactly do those numbers mean? The numbers aren't the easiest things to define, to be honest, but we're gonna break it down as best we can. It's about to get wild. I know you don't probably think that about plastic, but trust me, <laughs> this is like the nerdiest of the nerdy awesomeness. So the first number you see might be the number one. Usually, but not always, has the abbreviation PET or PET. The PET stands for polyethylene terephthalate. It's a type of plastic used for soda bottles or other beverage bottles, medicine jars, peanut butter jars, and it's a very common plastic. Actually, we mentioned earlier, the most common plastic. Number two inside a little recycling triangle is high density polyethylene has the abbreviation HDPE on it, usually milk jugs, shampoo bottles, and cleaning products, different kind of plastic. Number three is polyvinyl chloride. If you remember that from earlier also, PVC. Makes pipes for plumbing, detergent bottles, things that are toxic that it has to hold, it's a little less porous. Number four is low density polyethylene, that is an abbreviation of LDPE. It's a soft, flexible plastic, so think plastic shopping bags, sandwich bags, uh, cling wrap stuff, you know, the plastic wraps. Number five is polypropylene or PP. It's like a yogurt container or a ketchup bottle or a syrup bottle. It's a specific type of plastic for those types of things. Number six is polystyrene. Remember that little bastard from earlier, styrofoam? We don't like them. Super difficult to recycle, bad for the environment. We'll come back to that in a minute. Then there's number seven, which is labeled, I kid you not, other or miscellaneous plastic. <laughs> Any soft plastic, so it could be acrylic, it could be nylon, any of those. All of the numbers one through six are considered recyclable. You can put them in your recycle bin that you take out to the curb. Go take a look at some of the plastic bottles you've put in there. Make sure you didn't put a number seven in there. These numbers came about because recyclers needed a way to figure out what plastic everything was without having to teach the public to put low density polyethylene in this bin and high density polyethylene in that bin and PVC in this bin and peat in that other bin. You know, it's much easier to just give them all a number and say, here's the plastics, go to town. But we wanted to know how this actually works, right? So there's a five step process to recycling, collection, sorting, chipping, washing, and pelleting. That's the super cool one, we're gonna get there. So collection, pretty self-explanatory. Recycling facilities pick up the recycling from curbside bins. Now, if you really think about it, Moving things around is something humans, especially in the West, have gotten incredibly good at. We take a banana from somewhere in Central America and we move it all the way to the United States, filter it all the way into the middle, far from the coast using boats, trucks, trains, all sorts of things, and we get them there and then we have to just get rid of that banana peel, easy. But when it comes to plastic, we have to get it from somewhere to somewhere and then from where it ended up, like your house, all the way back to somewhere where it could be taken care of. So that's collection. It's self-explanatory and simple, and yet also really complicated to follow that piece of plastic all the way from where it's made back to a recycling facility. But once it gets back to the facility, then we have to do the sorting, that's number two. Sorting is where somebody or a machine or a person, you know, it depends on the recycling center, takes those numbers and separates them because not all of those things get recycled in the same way. So they need to make sure that they're each in their own line. Twos with twos, fives with fives. Step three is chipping. This involves dumping all the piles of plastic types into a machine that can then chop up that plastic that's all alike into small pieces. 
Actually, this is the coolest step in my brain. Like, I just want to see a machine that's like, here's all these milk jugs. Let's chop them into little bits. That'd be super neat to watch. This me? No? You guys not into that? Okay. Step four, washing. These steps, again, pretty self-explanatory. The chopped up pieces are then washed because, say you're chopping up laundry detergent bottles, you need to make sure you get all the detergent off before you start recycling the plastic parts. You could also have bits of food or dirt or, you know, any number of other things that get caught on the plastic. You can't recycle that stuff. You can only recycle the plastic. So you got to get that off there. Uh, the solution that they are washed in is what makes this step so important. It's an alkaline cationic detergent and water. So it cleans them, but it also prepares them for the next step, which is pelleting. The plastic is then melted down. And this is exactly how you probably pictured it if you've ever thought about it, right? You have to do all of this stuff first to clean it and to make sure that it's all together and it's all the same type of plastic. You don't want to melt some PVC in with some peat. It probably wouldn't work. You need to make sure it's all PVC and then you can melt it down and put it into an extruder. An extruder is a super awesome word for a spaghettifier, right? It takes the plastic and puts it into thin little noodles so they can be sliced into tiny little pellets by rotating blades. Actually, I take back earlier, the chopping step sounds cool, but this step sounds also really cool. So maybe I just wanna see both of those. I'm sure there's a how it's made on this on the Science Go app. You can download it at your app store, watch it. It's awesome. So after this whole process, those little pellets are what is left over. And those little pellets aren't just like instantly made into other things. That's a product that your recycler can then resell. This is how it works. It's all about making a little bit of money off of other people's trash. One person's trash is your recycler's treasure because that's their job. They don't just recycle out of the goodness of their heart. It's a business. So they take all of these things, they recycle them, they chop them up into little pieces, and then they sell them to people who can take that PVC or peat or whatever and make more milk jugs or whatever they want to make out of that plastic. A lot of companies don't like using this recycled plastic. It's not the same as quote unquote virgin plastic that hasn't gone through the recycling process. Uh, that's why plastics aren't always the best because even if you feel great about, oh, I recycled that, I put it in the recycle bin. Sometimes recyclers don't recycle all of those numbers. They might only recycle a couple of them. When I was growing up, my recycler only did twos and fives. That's why I default to thinking of those as recyclable. But I also was one of those kids who knew that we recycled twos and fives because I'm a nerd. But we'll come back to this. So that brings us to what we wanted to know more about, and that's unrecyclable plastic. Plastic that doesn't get removed from landfills and doesn't, you know, get turned into a business. Because shouldn't all plastic be recyclable? Shouldn't I be able to melt down any piece of plastic and turn it into something else? It comes down to demand. The Material Recovery Facilities, or MRFs, make their money on the quality of plastic that they can make at their facilities. So if they want to produce the best pellets so that they can sell it to other companies to use in their products, they're only going to do that with the best plastics. They're not going to just take any plastic because, again, out of the goodness of their hearts. There are a few things that determine a plastic's recyclability or the demand for that plastic. One is the resin type. Those are the numbers that we mentioned earlier, one through seven. Two is the shape. If it takes too much energy to reshape it, then it's not worth that much to the MRFs. It needs to be easy to recycle. So that means certain facilities are just not going to accept things. A good example of that are plastic bags. Plastic grocery bags are very difficult to go through this process. Imagine trying to set up a machine that could easily chop up plastic bags. Try throwing a plastic bag into your ceiling fan. It's not going to work. No matter how many you throw in there and how sharp you made your ceiling fan, it's not easily going to chop that plastic bag in half. It's difficult to get it into this process and automate a way to get it to be broken down. So those often do end up in landfills and the only way they can break down is by UV exposure. When that happens, they don't actually disappear. But again, we're gonna come back to some of this stuff. Sometimes non-recyclable plastic will also go into the recycling stream. Like if you threw something that's non-recyclable in with some PVC, which is recyclable, that makes the plastic lose its value. Non-recyclable plastic that gets sorted out before it contaminates the recycling stream will get sent to a landfill. So if that recycler doesn't recycle the three, they might just send all of their threes to a landfill. So even though you put it in the recycle bin, it may not end up recycled. And that just is the problem. Because once something gets into a landfill, 
It just sits there. It's literally a hole in the ground that you dump trash into, right? It takes hundreds or hundreds of thousands of years to degrade, not biodegrade, degrade. According to professor of chemical and biochemical engineering at Michigan State University, go Spartans, go green, Romani Narayan, probably butchered your name, I apologize, quote, no one has really measured how long it takes, but it's there for a long time, and we knew that. I even when it does start to degrade, when it breaks down, it's not actually less dangerous than it was when it was just a plastic bottle or bag. It can be more dangerous because it can form small little pieces that get eaten by animals. And then it works its way back up into the food chain and might be eaten by you or me. A good example of that is the Pacific Garbage Patch. It's this giant area the size of Texas floating around in the Pacific. Now, if you came up to it, it doesn't look like a bunch of plastic floating in the ocean. What it is are microscopic pieces that have been ground down by the mechanical process of the waves, and now fish eat them, and sea turtles eat them. And then when you eat those fish, you get plastic in you. It's weird and gross and really, really terrible. And it'll be out there for hundreds of thousands of years or more, who knows? There is one way that you can feel better about plastic. I'm not saying that it's good, I'm just saying you can feel better about it, and that is that you will buy biodegradable plastic. It's here to save the day, right? It's biodegradable. Unfortunately, it's actually a much more complicated topic than just saying, oh, this is biodegradable plastic, you're fine. According to the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry, there are three ways that something can biodegrade. First, there is the primary way. That's the chemical alteration of the property of the substance. It's not the best because it's still terrible for the environment. The second is known as the environmentally acceptable way. This is the biodegradation of the undesirable properties of that compound. Then we have the ultimate biodegradability. That is the complete breakdown of a compound, either to be fully oxidized or reduced into simple molecules. So basically, it goes from what we would call plastic into stuff like water, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrate, stuff that the environment can actually use. Hearing some of the names of those molecules, though, might point out to you that if we used all of the biodegradable plastics, we're just going to be releasing carbon dioxide, methane, and things like that into our environment. Similar to driving cars, probably not the best plan. Greenhouse gases, not good. So from that, it kind of highlights that just because you can recycle plastic and just because plastic is so-called biodegradable doesn't mean that that plastic is good for the earth any more than the plastic was bad before we could recycle or biodegrade it. Plastic will degrade regardless. If you put a plastic bag in the sun, the UV light from the sun will slowly destroy that bag. It will slowly get rid of it. But all it's doing is the same thing that the processors would do, and that's find a way to break it into tiny pieces. But instead of breaking it into pellets that can be melted down to make more plastic bags, because that's pretty much impossible by current standards, instead it breaks into the polymers, into the tiny molecules that then live in the environment. Probably forever. We don't know. Bioplastic is another way that people are trying to make plastics that can live with the earth. They add chemicals to plastic to help it break down in the presence of bacteria. It's a petrochemical created plastic, so it still uses hydrocarbons. But studies have shown that many of these additives, they don't actually do much to help the degradation process. Bioplastic is made of corn, but it can be made of other things as well. And from that corn, we get a substance called polylactide acid or PLA. Bioplastics need a very specific combination of bacteria and temperature to break down, so it doesn't break down in a landfill and only in special facilities, and there are very few of those. Let's say we figured out a way to take all of this plastic we're producing and replace it with a completely biodegradable plastic that doesn't release harmful greenhouse gases, that isn't going to damage the environment, that isn't going to get in the ocean or into fish. What if plastic were just perfect for the environment? Or Heck, what if plastic never existed? What if we stopped making it completely? What would that world look like? To find out, come back to DNews Plus tomorrow. So make sure you subscribe so you get episode three about plastic. Make sure you come find the show on Twitter. You can find us at DNews. You can find me at Trace Dominguez. And thanks for tuning in.